I was a scientist, I have a PhD in chemistry, and I found it extremely unacceptable that today, getting a chronic disease is literally a matter of bad luck. You get multiple sclerosis, you get autism, you get cancer, you get something, bad luck. That is literally unacceptable. We have solved huge problems, you know, decades ago. We've taken people to the moon decades ago. <laughs> you, we have all the science and technology to solve these problems. We just need to do it. God, let's hope that I'll doesn't do, make I'll it do. into the jingle. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we are going to be speaking with Dr. Momo, as he is affectionately called. Um, he is in the waiting room. We're going to bring him onto the call right Dr. now. Dr. Momo. Da -na 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 -na. Dr. Momo. Da -na 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 -na. Oh! Dr. Momo. Dr. Momo. <laughs> Greeting, Dursling. <laughs> what a pleasure <laughs> to have you with us. Pleasure. Hello, guys. Are you sitting in a pub, sir? Oh, you do look like you're in a pub. No, oh, I'm sitting in my bed. Oh. oh. Okay. <laughs> you sleep in a pub? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you lucky devil. <laughs> Very lucky. Yeah, Rob oh. is very jealous. <laughs> yeah, we'd be too actually living in a pub. Actually, I do live in a pub. I own one. Yeah. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> hey, guys, so here we are, uh, another episode of the Earth Locker, and we are, as our Earth guest Locker. today, it's you, it's you, Dr. It's Momo. And before I try to murder your name, could you please tell me the correct way to pronounce your name? The last name is Vujicic. 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 Yeah. Dr. Momo Vujicic. Will you give your two cents? Can you see? You can't. His, he no, can't see us. He can only hear us. No, he can see us. Oh, good. You can. You can see us. You can oh yeah, too there. far away. Look, it's worth it. It's worth it, right? <laughs> Today, Dr. Momo, we're doing less of a sitting down podcast, more of a sort of a running around. <laughs> Here he goes. I'm just gonna. His... Oh, that's the that's our logo. The logo that everyone will be seeing very soon. There you go. <laughs> For the it's just, podcast. It's just new and we're very excited about it. <laughs> very cool. <laughs> very brave. Um, so, Dr. Momo, uh, we're super excited to have you on. Uh, we're all massive fans of Viome. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, in particular, took a test. Uh, phew, Rob, I, I can't even remember, but it must be a year and a half ago now. Um, and... Initially, the reason for that was because of my son who has autism and we wanted to try and get his diet in check. And I had experience with other people that had taken the Viome test. And I was amazed by how much of a difference it made to my son and to the rest of my family and to myself. Energy levels, awesome. various things that I felt were a problem at the time. You know, I'm always trying to be more optimal. How all these things changed purely through diet, right? So I want to tell our viewers through your voice why Viome is something that everyone should be doing and how we truly, well, so through your words, you know that chronic disease is something that can be a choice if we go down this road. Yeah, well, um, first of all, let me clarify some things. I'm not on the commercial side of Viome, so I'm not going to try to convince anyone to buy anything from Viome. <laughs> yeah. I am... I'm co-leading the Viome Research Institute, so we're very focused on science. And uh, I would like to say just a few things about Viome so that people get an, an idea of, of what kind of a company we are, because we're extremely different from other, all other companies. And the stereotypical company, we just don't fall into that bucket at all. And so uh, both Naveen and I had this incredible passion for solving the problem that no one is solving. And we started Viome as the best vehicle for, for solving this problem. And the problem is that we currently have a global epidemic of chronic diseases. More than 50 chronic diseases are essentially taken over the whole world, have taken over the whole world. Give us some of the highlights, that, Doc. The... Give us some of the highlights of those chronic diseases, Doc, for yeah, ignoramuses yeah, like myself. I'll give you, absolutely. So I'll give you one that I think is very relevant to your, to your country. I don't know if you guys know, but Alzheimer's is the number one killer of females in the UK. Wow. It took over heart disease back in 2016. So we it have took a disease. Over heart disease, crikey. Yeah. So we, ha so we have a disease that essentially didn't exist a generation ago. Wow. And today it's the number one killer. That's, that's a really bad thing. But here's the worst thing to me as a scientist. No one knows what causes it. We, we literally don't know anything. And then what's really, really, really painfully frustrating to me is that everyone, including pharma and academia, is focused on how do we actually manage the symptoms of this disease? Mm. Very, very few people are focused on 
what is the root cause? How do we actually prevent it? Right. No, so I, even, I, even I remember when I was 16, me and my friend were staying in a B and B because we were making this TV thing, and uh, because we used to have to save up things to remember so that we could go down the internet cafe and resolve certain debates and arguments. Right. One of the ones that we'd written down was what find out what causes Alzheimer's, and I remember we went down, looked it up. And on an extremely surface level, we found a, a thing that said neurofibrillary tangles. I'll never forget that for as long as I live because I had to memorize it before going to an internet cafe. What a, was uh, that? So do you know what is, that is? Is that like, the, yeah, what, it, like that's, so, that's so sort of... Like, these are the proteins, yeah, these are the human proteins that cause these tangles in the brain. And so, see, that's, that's sort of the fundamental concept I want to convey here is that many academics and all of pharma consider that to be the starting point that right. they should really go after. Mm. Whereas that's really the culmination of decades of underlying root cause problems that causes these tangles. And so they're starting at essentially the, the physical manifestation of the disease. We want to be decades ahead of that stage, the tangles mm. never show up. Mm. And really that's the concept that we, we really need to push that concept to mostly academics, but also pharma needs to realize that the good old times of making a drug and, and, and converting a person into a lifetime customer, those times are over. People are sick and tired of that. People are sick and tired of yeah. paying for medications, going to the hospitals, getting hospital bills, getting the runaround. Those times are over. That's 20th century. We need to have a responsible management of healthcare because the current situation is already unsustainable and it's yeah. getting worse and worse. That's True. what we were just chatting about, uh, Dr. Momo, before you came on, was the fact that Tom Hopper there, who, who very, uh, uh, had great privilege growing up in the UK, OK, uh, you know, got leg swooped by a 40 grand medical bill when he first moved to the US, which he was like, this can't possibly be for me. Yeah. You know, I was so surprised by the concept and by the ferocity of the bill. Yeah, and I was getting, you know, people knocking at the door saying you owe us money. I was like, I don't know who you are or why owe you wow. money. They're like, okay, well, you've got to work in our not, club for a while. That's not typical. You've got to wear but, this. But if, but if we zoom if we zoom out of each individual country and look at the healthcare as a cost, um, the, to, to treat a person with, let's say, inflammatory bowel disease in the US or the UK, it costs $100,000 per year per person for the rest of their life. And yes, in the U.S., the person is responsible for that payment. In the U.K., the taxpayers are paying that, right? And mm -hmm. so you have a situation where in the U.S., wow. we have a lot of people who are going bankrupt because they're unable to get treatment. In the U.K., the economy is actually being broken by the healthcare system. You already are in a situation where you're unable to treat all of your sick people, and yet there's no more room for more money being poured into, into the economy. It's an unsustainable. Oh. I just You're this allowing the population to get sick and then pouring enormous amounts of money into managing the symptoms. That's an unsustainable system. It, it keeps growing. The only way to address this problem is to prevent disease. That is the only way we need to do, do it. And so we really need to, I really want everyone, all the academics, all the smart and hardworking people in sciences to focus on prevention. And the reason for that is because, okay, 40 years ago, we didn't know about the gut microbiome. We didn't know about so much chemistry. We didn't have the tools and technology to actually solve these problems. So, okay, 40 years ago, you could have said, well, we just can't do it. Today, we possess 100% of all science and technology to prevent every single chronic disease. And so wow. we, there is no wow. excuse. There is no more excuse. We just have to do it. But what's the, the what's, what's is, preventing, what's preventing right. the shift, exactly. the changeover? Go Great on. question. Let's so, hit, hit, hit it okay, with So let's talk about the incentives, right? People mm. work off incentives, okay? Mm -hmm. Academics are a large group of people who are some of the smartest, hardest working people, well-meaning people in the world, right? Massive, massive population. Their incentive is to get the next grant. That is what they live for. In order to get the next grant and continue their research, they have to publish papers. And that's mm -hmm. it. Those are their two incentives. They are mm -hmm. not either paid or retained or rewarded for spinning out companies and solving problems that help people live better lives. That right. is not the incentive. Of course, of course. So 
So they're going to study some transcriptional regulation of some type of a cell in your gut. And you read that paper and you say, I have no idea what this means. I literally don't know what to do with this, right? Yeah. Whereas they are going to publish a nature paper and they're going to get the next big grant and they're mm -hmm. going to keep rolling. And so in, in, in my mind, as a person who wants to benefit from all this science and want other people to benefit, the academia is mostly spinning their wheels. They're, mm -hmm. they're cycling through papers, grants, papers, grants. That's their incentive. And, and we need to break that cycle. Their money is coming from big pharmacological companies, I assume. Well, big corporate. well no, no, mostly from the government, mostly from the government. But the incentive right. is publications. The incentive is not to help people live better lives. Now, this is a generalization. This is what, not do you mean, what do you mean the, the priority is the publication of papers? Is it about the, yes. is it about the dissemination of information for the government? Exactly, is that the, exactly. Right, right, That's right. That's exactly right. In so when you, when, you, when, you ask, when you ask the government for money, the, the absolute number one uh, factor that determines whether you're going to get that money or not is how well published you are. Really? That is, the, yeah. that is the currency of, of so academic science. It's like your Christ. It, Dr. So, Momo, going back exactly. to you, I mean, you had 12 years doing research at Los Alamos and other really amazing yeah. places. What took you, I mean, we haven't even, even talked about your incredible story, what brought you to this path to start with, but is that why you've made the leap from institutional research into private enterprise? Absolutely, research? absolutely yes, absolutely yes, exactly. I'm speaking from, from my own experience. So, but let's, let's just quickly touch up on pharma, right? So mm -hmm. the big pharma has the money, has the know-how, has the expertise and has the technology to prevent every single chronic disease. However, pharma is funded by venture capitalists who want return on their investment. If they find that personalized nutrition prevents inflammatory bowel disease, how are they going to make money off that, mm. right? They're currently making $60,000 per person per year <laughs> off these uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. That is an enormous amount of money. We're talking about tens of billions of dollars, per, you know, yeah. For, for one kind of a drug per year. Call, it, call it wishful so, thinking, Dr. Momo, but wouldn't it be right. interesting so if policy you can't, uh, I'm sorry, but just really quickly saying that you, 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 if you have the, the, the answer to chronic disease and you are a, a, a company that you, it would be like withholding information in a case, you know, to, to withhold that information that could yeah. benefit millions of people. That could, right. that could be a law, surely. Do you know what I mean? That if you have a cure, there's some duty to the rest of the human race. Well, but no, they, you know, the pharmaceutical companies don't have the cure, but they don't seek the cure. They're not incentivized to find a cure. They yeah, don't want to teach symptoms. you how to fish. Yeah, they want, they want to sell you fish every single day. They don't want to teach you how to fish, right? Yeah. That's really the concept. Okay, so let's get back to my journey. So I was unfortunate enough to develop a chronic disease at a young age of 25. I developed, you know, idiopathic rheumatoid arthritis. Idiopathic means I have no idea what it is and what causes it, but you're sick. And we're going to give you drugs to manage that, to slow it down, right? So for 15 years, I took drugs and I was still getting worse. And I was, I had about 10 years before I was going to hit a wheelchair. How many per and day were you taking? Like how many drugs well, per day? Well, it depended on the day, but mm -hmm. multiple per day, right? Wow. And so... And so pain, the lots drugs, of pain, lots of pain in your legs. You're lots of pain. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately in my thirties, before I did anything in my life, lifted anything, brushed my teeth, put on my clothes, drove anything. I had to think about, should I do it? If I'm going to do it, how am I going to do it? And after I do it, what kind of treatment am I going to apply? Do I need ice? Do I need ibuprofen? Do I need both? Huh. You know, how long have I been taking ibuprofen? Is my, are, are my stomach ulcers going to go up? Do I need to switch to naproxen? Do I need to switch to Tylenol? These are the kinds of... I mean, they're all, they're all atrocious circuits. on your stomach. I mean, the thing is that when you have a chronic disease, people don't realize it takes all you can think about because mm. you can't just do things like healthy people. And yeah, unfortunately, this is now... And it's all consuming. And so... I was a scientist, I have a PhD in chemistry, and I found it extremely unacceptable that today, getting a chronic disease is literally a matter of bad luck. You get multiple sclerosis, you get autism, you get cancer, you get something, bad luck. That is literally unacceptable. We have solved 
huge problems, you know, decades ago. We've taken people to the moon decades ago. <laughs> you, we have all the science and technology to solve these problems. We just need to do it. And here's one of the things. Whenever someone talks about these things, like scientists, politicians, leaders, all these different agencies, like the UK NHS, the NIH in the US, all these agencies, when they talk about these problems, stop talking about them. You have every single tool at your disposal to solve it. Amen do to it. that. Do it. Yeah. Go do it. Don't talk about it. Stop talking about it. We've been talking about it for 20 years. We know we don't need any more review articles to tell us how prevalent autism is. We already know it's a it's a it's an absolute urgent issue. Go solve the root problem, the root cause of that problem. And so we need to hold our leaders accountable for utilize the science and technology to actually solve the problem. Well, well, what is, the, what is really, the problem in a nutshell in your, in your mind? What's the problem, that very problem? Well, it's a, it's a series of problems, but mm -hmm. we really need to focus the smart people and the money we have at the root causes of chronic diseases. That's what we need to do. Which and occurs so that, in the gut, these root causes well, you're, uh, that you're referring to a bit vaguely. Yeah. Tell well, us yeah. what you mean by yeah. them specifically a bit. Well, yeah. So let's talk about the microbiome. So, so one of the main reasons that we have not solved the problem of chronic diseases is that we've looked at the wrong place. When people talk about depression, people, all the doctors have focused on the brain, right? Yeah. I'll just give you, I'll just give you a really, really cool example. A, a peer reviewed okay. case study uh, came out. So this is a scientific publication that was vetted by the, by the scientific and medical community. A person suffered from bipolar disorder. If you go look at government agencies, they say bipolar disorder is a disease. You do anything about it. And we don't know what causes it, right? And so the uh, person suffered from this bipolar disorder. She was not able to le live her life at all. She mm -hmm. tried every drug. They threw everything at her and it didn't help. So she got obviously really sick and tired. She read about the gut microbiome and she said, you know what, we're going to do an FMT. This is a fecal microbiota transplant. She literally took poop from her husband and she gave herself enemas with that poop. That's it for six months. Okay. And after six she months. She gave herself enemas with that poop. What does, what does yes. that look like? Yeah. So, so actually yeah, there was kids now on, on Amazon. Iron's just going to so do it the best. <laughs> That's a good question. There are kits on Amazon and there are YouTube videos that explain how to do do it yourself, uh, fecal microbiota transplant. Okay. And it's not and dangerous it's really at all to do this, to, to take the, because I've heard a lot about these FMTs. Um, there's yeah, a lot of research going into it. There's a lot of research yeah, going into it for autism as well. And it's right, something that really exactly. interests me. So yeah, what, what actually is happening when you do that? Mm. Yeah, so so the the two leaders in the FMT for autism, Rosa and uh, and Jim at uh, University of Arizona, you're probably familiar with them. Yeah, uh, um, they were also so, a kid's puppet show from my childhood. <laughs> okay. Rosie and Rosie and Jim, they lived on a <laughs> Rosie and Jim. That's exactly their Chris names, Rosie Cameraman. and Jim. Rosie and Jim. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so so these people, so these two professors, they actually do translational research. And they, they did FMT in 18 autistic kids and they all got better and they stayed better for two years. Wow. And so what they did. Okay. So, yeah. So sorry to slow you down, Dr. Yeah. When you say they got, they got better, you know. Yeah. What were the improvements? Was, did they, yeah, were these nonverbal yeah. kids? So, were they? Yeah. So, it was so different. The summary <laughs> is, <laughs> the summary is that their gastrointestinal and behavioral symptoms were reduced overall on average by 50%, right? Wow. Uh, after three months of this, of this uh, fecal treatment, right? Now, here's the thing, guys. This is a start. These, these uh, professors didn't have the technology to select the right donors. They didn't have the technology to know what to feed these children after FMT, which we are developing. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we combine, when we combine uh, the, the choosing the right donor and then following up with the right diet after the fecal transplant, mm -hmm. I think that we're going to be able to achieve much higher percent improvement than 50%. This is just a random attempt. You can get those kits really well. online, Dr. Momo. You can get them on. You can, on order, and then you, you, can, them you, you can take and healthy actually, poo and give it to the unhealthy person at home. <laughs> That's I mean, Dr. Dr. Momo, that being said, I mean, when you do the VIA research, so this could be one of the things that's going to be a spinoff of the data you're collecting through VIA, correct? That's going to allow us to well, pinpoint other so, therapies? Yeah, so, so exactly. So, so at VIA, we've created a platform 
that has many, many different applications. Certainly precision fecal microbiota transplant would be one of those, but mm -hmm. there are many others. Um, let's go back quickly to my bipolar example, because that's really uh, one of the big take home messages for your, for yeah, your audience. Yeah, please, please. So, so this, per, this woman got tired of essentially not getting better for years and, and she was in her twenties and she just couldn't function. She did six months of fecal microbiota transplant from her husband and she completely cured herself, meaning that <sighs> six months follow up and three years follow up by her doctor could not longer diagnose her with bipolar disorder. She had no symptoms of bipolar disorder. And so this, this fallacy that something is wrong with the brain of the people has been around for 50 years plus, and it's been completely incorrect. And what we're now realizing is that nothing was wrong with her brain. What was wrong was that there were microbes in her gut that were missing due to either antibiotic overuse or preservatives in our food or super clean lifestyle or a combination of all three. Super these clean microbes, lifestyle. What does that look like? like sort of drinking super your own clean lifestyle is everything around you is sterile, right? Oh, oh right. You, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought you meant like a kind yeah, of Yeah, exactly. Every surface, that. every food, everything we eat. So think about how humans, Homo sapiens, lived, let's say, even 500 years mm. ago. You harvested a carrot from the ground. You had no running water. You had no soap. You had no peelers. What did you do? You rubbed off the major soil and you ate it. You probably consumed a gram of soil every carrot you ate or any other root vegetable, right? We don't do that anymore. We peel everything. We sterilize everything. We kill all the healthy microbes that we co-evolved to live with. I so must say, I, I, I peel nothing. Yeah, I keep, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I think- I must say, it's just more work, isn't it? It's it like, is, yeah. I mean, I started, yeah. doing, Jamie Oliver, um, who's a chef over here, I'm not sure if you know him, Momo, was oh, saying that, yeah, so, so Jamie Oliver said, for years he's been peeling his veg and actually now there's so much flavor and goodness in the peel so he's like don't yep. peel them don't peel your carrots they so i started well, leaving them in yeah it says well um, besides, ginger besides the, the the ginger is really the... um, nutritious sorry Dr. Oh. <laughs> yeah but besides the nutritional content of the peels it's really important that we introduce and reintroduce the environmental microbes because mm. those have a huge overlap with our own gut microbiome and so Here's another take home for your, for your listeners. As, as humans they evolved can see you the too, Dr. Momo. Years, they can see that? you, right? They can see what oh, you right. hang right above your bed stead. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a watercolor painting from a, from a French village. Okay, oh, so, that's, that's nice. Um, go. So, so what's very, very important to understand is that uh, a human body is an ecosystem and in order for it to fun function properly, we must have a healthy microbiome. And that is the oral microbiome, the lung microbiome, the gut microbiome, the skin microbiome. We have literally evolved to live with these and to depend on these microbes for healthy living. Meaning that if we don't have them, we cannot be healthy. And the reason why that is, is because we have evolved this symbiotic relationship over millions of years. I'll give you some examples. Should I go into some specific examples? Please, yeah. Just really quickly before you do All that, right. oh, this okay. is why my friend who I just met this morning came out looking like a, a terrorist in a park because he's like sunglasses, bandana right up to the cheeks, hat down, scarf, because... Uh, frankly, his wife doesn't have the correct information because she's, <laughs> she's trying to keep uh, their world as sterile as possible, Dr. Momo. And this is what I was trying to tell Roger. Uh, right. No, well, unfortunately, you... during COVID, we have to pay attention to that. And Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Something that we have to keep an eye on because we, w the reason that we have created the sterile world is because in 1800s, the number one killer were infectious diseases, right? And so this sterile world has, has really diminished the infectious disease effects on, on at, at least you know, developed countries for the most part. But we have now introduced these chronic diseases. And so mm. um, we're gonna have to be very careful moving forward how clean you have to be and, and, and what kind of things you can do. But certainly organic farming is one thing you can do to enrich your microbiome without worrying too much about COVID. Right. Mm -hmm. right, right. Okay. That's a good, that's a good. Let's look. go for examples yeah. that are, that are sort of uh, very important and very relevant for people to understand. So let's talk about a microbe who, that can live in the soil and it can live in our intestines. 
And this microbe has evolved to live in both environments. It has enough genes to support its life in the soil and in the gut microbiome, in, the, in our intestines. So um, in order for it to live successfully in the soil, it has to behave a certain way. It has to express certain genes, certain sus, su subset of its genes. A bit more specific, Doctor. A bit more specific. It's just... Yeah. So It has to express we, certain we genes. It it's just, it's hard to fully click That's, into what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about a little bit about that. So this microbe has 4,000 genes, and we've heard about these that code for a certain function, right? Right, wow. But under no circumstances, are all 4,000 genes active. The, all, the microorganism only activates the genes that are necessary to live in the environment in which it's in, right? That's so so cool. that's let's like, say- It's like Megazord at the end of Power Rangers or something. It's, it's, it's it, you know, the, the microorganisms, even though they're tiny, they have their sensors, they can sense their environment and they can activate only the genes that are necessary for that environment. And so I'll give you a specific example. If a microbe is processing, let's say some kind of a, a complex carbohydrate from the soil, and it's activating 10 different genes to degrade it and consume it, and then you give it sugar like glucose, it says, wait a minute, there's glucose here. It's very easy to process. I need to deactivate all these other genes that are unnecessary because they're just a waste of my energy. I'm mm -hmm. just going to express or activate the genes that I need to consume this glucose, and I'm going to grow really fast because glucose gives me energy very quickly. So it adjusts it's called behavior, but it's really activation of genes. So let's get back to this organism. It's, been switching. it's living in soil it's off switching and it's and continuously. It problems. It, yeah, it's continuously switching. Exactly. So this microorganism is continuously producing a chemical. It's a molecule, right? And that molecule it has evolved. We have evolved as human as humans to receive that molecule and produce serotonin. You guys have heard of serotonin. It's a it's a major neurotransmitter. Yeah. Um, and in the body, right? And so, and, and this actually may play a big role in the onset of autism in the womb, but we can get into, into the weeds later. But basically this microorganism sends out this chemical signal to its environment. And if nothing returns, then it knows it's in the soil and it, it adjusts its life to living in soil. But if the return signal is serotonin, then it knows that it's in our intestines. That's how it probes its environment. And so we have evolved to the and this chemical signal by this microorganism to produce serotonin. So 90% of serotonin in the human body is produced in the intestines, not in the brain. Really? And that serotonin is not produced so on its own. Our, we don't our just serotonin say, is playing hard to get with a bacteria. Dirt it is. It is. Yeah. Exactly. It's wow. not, we don't independently produce it. We're waiting for this chemical, these chemical signals from the gut microbiome to produce it. And so without these chemical signals, we don't produce it. So now we don't know yet what exactly cured this woman of bipolar disorder. It's likely this kind of chemical signaling where we were missing certain chemicals that we are, our genes are unable to produce. She was missing those genes in the microbiome. And as soon as her husband's poop came over, those genes were active and they produced the right chemicals. Wow. They reestablished their balance and she was cured completely. Right. Oh, so, oh, so, on, oh, this so, concept. so you were about to say that, that they could, they could uh, send those signals to newborns. You were about to say something about babies. Well, newborns, as so in to prevent. This is a, this is a, yes, on this it. is a longer discussion. So, so yeah. I have a hypothesis that's, well, that's it's, it's your show, you. mate. You've, you've taken the full reins. God bless. Yeah. But I have a hypothesis that, microbial activity so the activity of the of the microbes in the gut in the gut of the pregnant mother determine the serotonin production and serotonin in the intestine by the mother actually crosses the placenta and influences the brain the growth of the brain and the wiring of the brain of the in, of the of the of the fetus such that the brain of the newborn is now pre-wired and predisposed to autism and then Maybe there are other signals that also develop later on. Well, not maybe. There are certainly other signals that develop and influence it later on, but it starts in the womb. Wow. But we really have to study that. Really and how does, it, how does that then correlate to, because obviously now they've said that there is a definitely a link between the gut and the brain and the development of autism in an infant. So where does that then link to the gut in day-to-day -day life for a child with autism and how that's prevented them from learning to speak and right 
Well, we, the, 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 the honest answer is we don't know. We mm. really need to pour a lot of money and research into this. But the hypothesis is that there's lots of neurotransmitters that are produced by, the, by our own human cells in the intestine, and they're signaling the vagus nerve to the brain what to do and how to develop. And, and that's the missing link. It's, it's the interaction between the microbes and these cells in our body that are generating and, and uh, neurotransmitters and transmitting the information to the brain. But we need a lot more research in that. Right. And, and, and let me propose, let me propose a very, very specific way, uh, mechanism by which we can actually solve these chronic disease problems. Do you guys know of the Manhattan Project? I've mm-hmm. heard of the Manhattan Project, yeah. That was where okay, they built so the a Manhattan nuclear bomb, wasn't it? Yeah. That's exactly yeah, right. You've got to tell people. There's an audience for this, man. Not hey, that's why, that's why he's asked us. All right. Okay, good. Yeah, so, so it's so nuclear. Before we move up. on, right? so, uh, so, it, was nuclear, yeah. it was the nuclear project where they built a nuclear bomb in secret in the US. Yes. Yes, back in exactly. 19, well, what was it? 1930 43. something. 43. So in 1943, obviously. But didn't uh, the they drop Nazis it the in Japanese, Japan in 1941? 45, 45. 45, sorry, yeah, yeah. So, so I want to exemplify that project not as its outcome, but as the organizational structure, right? So this, for this project, the U.S. government recruited the smartest people in the world who would have spent the entire career studying stuff and publishing papers, gave them unlimited resources, and gave them one problem to solve. Is this what and you're trying to get out there? Are you, are, you, are you trying to right. get this... Get this uh, get this ball rolling in the exactly in the so, so what's needed is a politician or some kind of a, a medical leader who says we are going to solve the problem of autism once and for all and we're going to create a manhattan project for autism we're going to put together the brightest minds we're going to give them unlimited amount of money and they're going to solve it in record time and we can do a manhattan project for autism for multiple sclerosis for heart disease for inflammatory bowel disease, for every one of these, there could be countries could take over different projects. And in five years, we could have true preventative medicine for all chronic diseases. There's nothing, nothing about this that, that is not available today. Could all we, we change the name to the leadership. Earth Locker Project and, and take credit for it? <laughs> uh, Dr. Dr. Mova, that's guys, interesting. You guys can, yeah. So, so this, is really, this is really how simple it would be. Okay, nice so let's right. get back right. to my story. Hang on one second, Dr. Momo. I mean, Dr. Momo, I think it's great that you talk about policy, and I think policy is super important. But reflecting back on what really causes change and kind of what you did yourself, you left the world of policy and publishing right. papers and went into private enterprise. So is isn't really, yeah. we got to be leaning on private enterprise to solve these problems. Kind of oh, what you do with Vine, yeah. so let's go. Let's go back to that. Yeah, let's go back to that transition. So, so basically what happened to me was that this, this, this journey of chronic disease ended with, I found a science-based personalized diet for me that completely cured me. It didn't slow it down. It didn't stop it. It completely cured it. So in 12 months, within 12 months of switching to this diet, I had zero symptoms of this disease, meaning that what, what, right what, before I... Go on. Yeah. Yeah. So what were you, uh, what was the type type of typical stuff you were eating of a day that kind of, well, I I mean, at that time I was eating a Mediterranean diet mostly because that's what I grew up with. Mm. And, but I tried all these different diets. I tried the ketogenic diet. I tried all kinds of different diets. None of them worked. Right. So just, uh, just to be clarified that Dr. Mono, you said you, you tried the ketogenic diet, paleo diet, vegan diet. You tried all these kind of fad diets, so to speak. (laughs) That's right. And yeah. none of those were. I tried about the, I tried about twenty of them, and none of them worked. And and I'll and I'll tell you, even though I'm a vegan today, or mostly vegan, and vegan diet works for me. The pro the challenge was that the uh, the molecule in mammalian foods that triggered my immune system to cause my disease is so stable that it stays in my body for more than a month. Meaning that I tried a vegan diet for two weeks and I didn't get better. And I gave up on it, but I didn't know the underlying biochemistry of this molecule and immune, immune reaction to it. So I couldn't have known that it would take that long. So and wait, so- so are you saying that the vegan, if you'd carried on with it for another few months, that perhaps it would have improved your situation? You don't know. Well, no, I know now no. that that's the case. So when I actually you know that, switched uh, what, away which is the case, that it would have or it wouldn't have. 
No, he knows now because he is vegan. So he knows oh, right, now. Great. Nice one. That Actually, Dr. Momo, I've heard you say that before. And quite specifically, what I'm interested in is how, how were you testing yourself in that crucial point where you're trying to cure yourself? Well, so, so first of all, I knew the underlying biochemistry of this molecule. The molecule is a sialic acid that gets integrated into my own cells, into human cells. And that's and so what causes the, arthritis, the room. That's what causes my arthritis. And unfortunately, right. arthritis is caused by many things that we have to discover. But in my case, and probably many other people's cases, mm. this is what triggers the immune system to, to, to mount this inflammatory reaction and destroy my own body. And so I knew based on these, based on the science that this molecules were very stable and I knew that I needed to stick it out. And so on February 18th, 2015, when I switched away from mammalian food, I was hundred percent strict. And so that's another sort of a weak, weak point in the whole dieting system is that people say, well, I can have my, uh, you know, one day where I can eat whatever I want. They'll mm, say, yeah. they go to a party or they go to a restaurant, they, get, they say, ah, it's not a big deal, right? The only way, the only way that I can get better is if I'm 100% strict for two months. Yeah. If I'm 99.99% strict, I will not get better. That's and interesting that's really, because that's really interesting because my, my son, we took my son, Freddie, uh, off sugar, right? Because we knew that sugar had a, a massively negative effect on, on his little body, right? And if people, like there's people that say, oh, he can have a little bit. Oh, it's his birthday or yeah, it's someone's parents, birthday. He can have a little bit of cake. Friend, but you can't. He, he, yeah. he, if you give him a little bit, he'll go through the roof and it'll affect him for like yeah. weeks if he, if he parents, has a relapse. My parents said a funny thing. Exactly. They go, uh, they sort of take a slightly a, a passive approach, you know, because, you know, the kids go to the Montessori and they might go to friends or, you know, they're very, still very little. But they go, Asher, you know, if they'd get it at another place, if they didn't get it he here. Kind yeah. of, they're just assuming that there's sugar flooding in the doorways <laughs> of every feckin' home. In, but, but, you know, I suppose it's a generational thing, too, to some degree as well. Yeah. Well, you know, also as a child, it's like it's your parents, it's the parents' responsibility to make sure that that child doesn't have it. You know, like it's uh, the way I see it. If it's something that you know is harmful to that child, why on earth would you give it to them? Yeah, especially like, if it's wrapped it's your responsibility. It's wrapped in welcoming colors. Yeah, that I makes know. It all the sneakier. It's not just for children. It's, it's difficult for adults. For example, and the more you know, delicious Romano, for like. example, cheese, you know, hard, hard cheeses or French cheeses or like oh, lamb. I, I just I mean, bought a bit of blue down in Borough America. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I love those things before, but I know they make me sick. And so I'm hundred percent clean and I don't compromise on that. So I mean, that's to really important to say have, yeah, Momo, yeah. that you, that for you, that is absolutely the case. And you now know that scientifically, you know that, but, there are some people that if they took out certain animal products of a, you know, if it's a good quality animal product, they would be missing a certain part of nutrition that would be helping them. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. My diet is absolutely not the solution for everyone. Absolutely. Mm. There is no one diet that fits all. If, if there was, we would have found it by now. No doubt. Which about comes it. back around to Viome. Yes, exactly. So this is exactly why we formed Viome. I realized during my journey that, every single person's microbiome is different mm -hmm. and it's, it's compositionally different. And so we need to fine tune that composition in com combination with diet for that person in order for the functional output to be the same. So let's delve a little bit into that because that's really the crux of the, the, the understanding of the microbiome. So one of the reasons that microbiome companies haven't made a huge progress in the, in the field of health is because everyone has been, has been looking at the gut microbiome with a, with a wrong lens. And the lens is, who is there? They want to understand, oh, they, they basically are following the paradigm of infectious diseases. If you have Vibrio cholerae micro, microbe, you will get cholera, right? One for one. Who's, this, who's saying have, this? Is this, the, is this the kind of medical profession at large kind of thing? This is, this is a, the scientific community. Medical professionals mostly rely on what's fed to them what's by the scientific the community. community. Yeah, so okay. the scientific community, unfortunately, since its inception, has been limited by the technology in terms of they only could sequence DNA, which tells them who is there and what's a potential, but it doesn't actually tell them what's actually happening. And so 
Um, so about eight years ago, I realized this, and luckily my background is in chemistry and also RNA biochemistry. So RNA, you know, everyone is afraid of RNA, this activity of genes, right? DNA. What's is RNA? Potential. What's RNA? What, what did you just? I have yeah. no idea what you just said for the last 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. Sorry, sorry mate. Okay. You don't have to slow let's down. Let's talk about that. You know. Yeah. Let's talk you've about got, that. You're a very, very intelligent man. You have a brain the size of a shed, <laughs> but you must slow down. <laughs> Okay, little- let's slow down. Let's take it easy. Okay, yes. so let's say you drink alcohol in a Yes, pod, I do occasionally. Okay? At the mo- occasionally, <laughs> right. Today, so. At that <laughs> moment, at that moment, when you start to drink alcohol, yeah. your liver cells, every single one of your liver cells has a gene. In fact, it has six genes, but let's simplify it. Has a gene for an enzyme called... Mm alcohol dehydrogenase okay your liver has that gene but that gene is not functional it's not doing anything it's a piece of dna sitting inside of cell you drink that alcohol and if that gene does not get activated you will be dead in a few hours because the alcohol will kill you okay Uh. but we have evolved to deal with alcohol your liver cells say oh shit there's alcohol in my blood it's going to kill me the liver cells copy that gene into RNA. So they copy it from DNA to RNA. And that's the process of activation of that gene. Now that RNA is then converted into a protein. And that protein is this alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme right. that is released in the bloodstream and it inactivates that alcohol. It detoxifies your body and it saves you. Wow. Now, So that's the coolest thing is that DNA is the potential. If that potential is not activated via RNA, it doesn't do anything. DNA is literally a blueprint. It doesn't do anything. It sits there. It's a physical object. So we've been looking at DNA for so long, and actually RNA is where we need to be looking. So it's it's RNA is a key player. RNA is super sexy, super hot, super (laughs) formative, Mm. action, 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 right? So... Uh, so now I'm interested. unfortunately, yeah, exactly. <laughs> very sexy. Unfortunately, RNA is unstable and it's very difficult to study. And, you know, during my PhD, uh, there were frustrating times, but we've grown to love each other. We're best friends now. Oh, RNA good. and I are best friends. Oh. Right. And so about, about eight years ago, I realized that DNA is never going to solve this problem. In fact, if you guys are old enough to remember in the 90s when the Human Genome Project was, was, was uh, starting, the promise was that once we sequence the human genome, we will unlock the secrets yeah. of all human disease. Yeah, right? I remember that. It was going to cure Guess all what? human disease. That hasn't happened. And the reason is because... The Y2K didn't happen either. <laughs> Y2K didn't happen either. They've been lying so to us. Well, it's not that we've been, no one's been lying. It's just that humans at that time didn't understand that human genes were not responsible for chronic diseases. It's the bacterial, microbial genes that were responsible for that. And so we just didn't know. But the point is that over the last 20 years, since we actually, since we sequenced the human genome, genomics has not made any improvement in chronic diseases. In fact, they've gone up significantly. Mm. You look at autism, autism has skyrocketed, Mm. even though we know the genome. Depression Has anyone gone around their lab, the, doctor, to check if they are working? Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps okay, they're, so let's, they're in their plane. Let's get back to the to sexy molecule called stashes. RNA. So RNA is very similar to DNA, but very, very, very different in that it's the function of our genes or microbial genes. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's talk about that for a bit and give you a specific example of how Viome works. So let's give a specific example where a person a typical person will have about three to 400 species of microbes, but let's reduce that to a very simple example. Let's say you have a a gut microbiome composed of only two bacteria, just two bacteria. And let's say that instead of these bacteria being able to do 4,000 different functions because they have 4,000 genes, let's say that they only have one gene each. Mm -hmm. Okay, so simplify things. Two bacteria, bacteria bacteria one gene each. Sounds like a, yeah. lot of, a lot of the content I watch of an evening. I'm joking. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> Jokes are good because I, I get pretty intense. So this is, this is good right. to, to bring up. Your, That's what Rob's here for. He's here to break it up. <laughs> Just so, uh, so, uh, so, okay. the so now this person, this person has two bacteria. Each one of them only has one gene. And 
One of those bacteria is using a polysaccharide from quinoa as food. And when it processes, when it chews on that polysaccharide from quinoa, it produces lipopolysaccharide. Let's shorten it LPS. Mm -hmm. And LPS, when it's produced by the gut microbiome, it tells our immune system, you're sick. Something is attacking you. Activate your immune system and start destroying everything, right? So it's a pro-inflammatory chemical. It unnecessarily activates our immune system and increases in, okay? The other bacterium that's in your gut microbiome is using a polysaccharide from apples. And when it produces, when it, when it chews, when it eats that polysaccharide, it, con it harvests energy from that polysaccharide and produces a compound called butyrate. Okay. You're right. Butyrate, 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 yeah. It has the opposite effect. It calms the immune system down. It tells the, the immune system, hey, everything's all right here. There's no need to get activated. Calm down. Right. So it's an anti inflammatory chemical produced by the gut microbiome. Right. Mm -hmm. If we know that, and we know that from the biome test, we don't guess that, we don't simulate it, we don't model it, we yeah. actually measure it. What we do you have think all we're going in the to do with that person? The we're going, the computer algorithm is going to say for this person, avoid quinoa. Mm. It said to me, avoid quinoa. I, I've said, I, I haven't eaten quinoa since. It's one of the things that I, oh, quite okay, successfully good. Stopped. I didn't good. stop at all, doc. But, <laughs> but this, is the, this is the most simplified version of the principle by which Viome's AI converts raw data that we obtain from someone's stool and understands exactly, hey, if you eat these foods, they contain molecules that your microbiome is going to convert to bad biochemicals. We need to stop eating those foods. And then what? there are other foods that contain molecules that your microbiome, and I'm emphasizing your microbiome, because another person's microbiome may use the same, the same foods to produce good biochemicals versus your microbiome may produce bad biochemicals. So it's very highly personalized. That's the unfortunate thing here. It's so complicated. That's why there isn't one diet that fits all. And so our algorithms basically today take the roughly 50,000 different activities of every person's microbiome, compare them against 15,000 molecules found in different kinds of foods, and run a thousand plus different algorithms to come up with one solution for that one person. Oh my God! What you should eat and what you should not eat. Wow. So we use supercomputers for that because the amount of data generated is simply beyond human comprehension. It's, mm. it's, it's taken obviously years to build this up, but uh, the combination of the type of data we generate and the AI that understands all this and the translational science team that we have that understands the microbial activities allows for this technology to work. Wow. Dr. Momo, talking about that, because you said everything's individual and the amount of data you're getting in with the AI that you guys translate into the biome results. It, are you noticing anything regionally between, I mean, I don't know how far reaching yeah, that's a good question. data, because obviously I would assume yeah. that America has the worst diet yeah. on the planet. Um, and then if you go to third world countries and other places that are a little bit more rural, I mean, is, yeah. is the data gone that far yet? You go to Biden? Ireland, there's a lot of fried haddock yeah. and, and greasy chips. <laughs> Avoid. So the, 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 the real answer is that we only really have enough data from the US, Canada, and the UK to be making um, any kind of regional assessments. And unfortunately, those three countries are probably the worst offenders. And so, um, you know, even though we are, we are currently serving customers from 60 countries and growing, the amount of data from those countries is not significant enough to make some conclusions. Mm. But I will say the following. Remember that we are all exactly the same species. We are all homo sapiens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A Japanese person and an Irish person need identical chemicals produced by their gut microbiomes mm. in order to have mental and physical health, identical chemicals. Mm. And therefore, <laughs> our platform doesn't care at all where you are. Now, you're absolutely right that different people have different uh, diets and different negative effects on their gut microbiome. And, and so we can identify those, but those are mo mostly academic. Those are mostly, mm. hey, the UK has a real big problem. The US has a big problem. And look at Kenya. They don't have that problem yet, but it's starting up. But mm. that's really academic. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. that does make sense. <laughs> but because I was wondering with, with the Viome Project and what you're doing and what you see, my feeling is about agriculture and how they grow food and things, commercial processes, fertilizers, weed killer. Are we seeing that in our Viome tests and results? 
and you know, obviously, it's going to yeah, be more. So, so we are we are seeing something. So we do have this with we, Naveen, yeah, about 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 yeah. the same. Uh, he he spoke briefly about the same uh, microbes existing in the soil that exist in your gut. So it's good to get clarity. Right, Sorry, right. I mean, you know, ten thousand years ago, when when humans were roaming uh, the planet and just digging up seeds and roots and so on, we were one with nature. We were like a recycling bin for the for the you know stool microbiome for the soil microbiome so that's how we evolved yeah. it's uh it's i mean today you can actually buy soil probiotics that are actually derived from soil and there's like hundreds of species of them mm. um oh okay. do you, what about your theory the other day about how they created us just to get around do you know what i mean well i mean like, that's kind of where i definitely got that from people like dr momo talking <laughs> about bacteria calling the shots not right. really our DNA. Yeah. That well, we, it's, it's kind to of, me, like it's a symbiosis. Things. It's right. not, they create, they didn't create us. We didn't create them. We really co-evolved. We really co-evolved to be in synergy. We are providing food for this, for these bacteria, but they're providing us. For example, That's, vitamin D. Sci-fi well. pitch is so a little bit less about, sexy. I'm just, I'm just saying. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about these kinds of things. So let's talk about vitamin, vitamin B12. You guys have probably heard of vitamin B12. It's essential. Of course, and you yeah. probably heard from people Oh, you're a vegan, so you can't. You need to eat meat because uh, vitamin B12 is not found in plants. Well, it turns out that the only the only organisms on the planet that can produce vitamin B12 are bacteria, very specific bacteria. So when you eat meat, the vitamin B12 content of that meat is there because the bacteria in the gut microbiome of that of that animal actually produce vitamin B12. Anyways, mm -hmm. we as humans used to have bacteria very commonly that produced vitamin B12, just like all other vitamins B and Ks, right? But today, because of the onslaught of antibiotics and preservatives and super clean lifestyle, we have lost those. In fact, wow. of the 20 or so species of bacteria that can produce vitamin B12, we have never seen 19 of those in 100,000 people that we've analyzed so far. Amazing. So 19 of 20 have vanished from the human microbiome. And one, which is E. coli, is still present commonly, but it's not, not there much. in everyone. <laughs> what about vitamin C, Doc? Is it possible that we were like goats once? So vitamin C comes from plants and bacteria do not produce it. And we have to consume lots of fresh fruits and vegetables to get vitamin C. There is a plant there's a fruit in Australia where two little apple looking things have enough vitamin C for a whole day. Uh, but many fruits, you can just look it up. Many other fruits contain vitamin C in large amounts and that's what mm -hmm. we need a lot of. And as you guys know, Kiwis. in this COVID-19 situation, vitamin C is one of the biggest um, influencers of the, of the immune system function. Mm. And for people who don't eat fresh fruit and vegetables, they're not gonna. They're not gonna have a, an immune system that's robust enough to respond to this virus. That was very interesting. What's your What's your opinion there? On, what's your opinion there on uh, the people that are obviously having these drastic reactions to COVID nineteen? Do you see that these anyone that has these sort mm. of what we know as chronic conditions like, like diabetes? and heart disease, you know, these are things that are, as we now know, are things that are contributed because of food and bad food choices. Mm -hmm. If people were making healthier food choices or could get access to a biome test and have their, their personalized diets, do you think that their immune systems would be in a better position to deal with COVID-19? Yeah. So, so, um, so let me talk about this and just to make sure we're not making any health claims about treating COVID-19, no. just so that we're very clear. But the core engine at Viome AI that, that makes food recommendations, it looks at pro-inflammatory biochemicals produced by each person's microbiome and anti-inflammatory potential of that the gut microbiome. Mm. And so one of our core goals for every person is to give that person the food that their microbiome will convert into anti-inflammatory chemicals, meaning to calm their immune system down and to minimize food that they consume that will allow their microbiome to produce pro-inflammatory chemicals. So we want to rebalance that, that. And as you guys probably know from COVID-19, one of the main reasons for death is the, is the over system. So it's well, not the virus. We just we dropped you in the key moment when you said one of the reasons for death is oh, that you, your Wi Fi dropped out. Went, wah, wah, yeah, wah. Sorry, my Wi Fi had a glitch. So, one of the main reasons for death COVID 19 
is the overreactive immune system. It's not that the virus directly kills us. You, it's that our immune system yeah. overreacts, overreacts and causes death. And so you guys can read about this. The, the, term, the, the technical term is cytokine storm. So you can read about the cytokine storm, but it's basically overreactive immune system. And right. so maybe, maybe diet that we ask everyone to follow, which rebalances these signaling molecules from the microbiome and calm the immune system down, yeah, right. maybe they would have a beneficial effect. The only way to know that is to run a randomized control trial, which is the gold standard for showing efficacy of any kind of therapy on any kind of out, you know, medical outcome. Yeah. And so, so do you think we that we that round? I mean, yeah. I'm sure, uh, you know, that could be, that could be a potential. I mean, I mean it, after well, all of this, after the lockdown, you know, it could be a potential for us to run that kind of a study. And we will absolutely run trials like this. We just, mm. we're still a young company and we have to be careful with what we run trials on. We have eight planned clinical trials. And so, yeah, so that's the connection that, um, Absolutely, I think that diet is going to have a huge module controlling effect of the microbiome, which then controls our immune system. I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys in your audience know that majority of the in the intestines. It's not in the blood or anywhere else. It's actually we lost. We lost you in the key very, moment again. Sorry, Doctor. Yeah. You just say yeah. yeah. Just say the, the 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 intestine sentence again, please. Yeah, the majority of our immune system lies in the intestines and not right. in the blood. Yeah, and yeah. it's listening to the chemical signals from the gut microbiome and nutrition and is learning and is prepping and is priming by that so that it can act accordingly based on different kind of uh, insults we have, including COVID-19. Yeah. But, um, but I want to I wanna mention something uh, quickly here is that, you know, we, we all encourage people to eat a healthy diet. And that's one of the most frustrating things that drove Naveen and I to start the company what is healthy diet? Mm -hmm. Today, you read a, a peer-reviewed scientific article that says coffee is good for you. Yeah. And you go and drink you, five cups of coffee. Right, Guess right, what? You know, a week later, corporate. it says coffee is bad for you. Yeah, that is the same thing with red meat. Push, that right? is the same oh. thing with cheese, with wine, with everything else in life. There's conflicting dietary information. And mm. the reason for that is that every single one of those studies is trying to find their premises is this food good for everyone or is it bad for everyone? That is the question they're asking. And well, they're there's asking no the one question. superfood, is there? People talk about superfoods exactly. and isn't. it's a, it's a ludicrous point. term. Mm. So they're asking the wrong question. Is coffee good for everyone or is it bad for everyone? And of course, their answer is going to be wrong because it's neither. So they're asking the wrong question. We have to ask the right question, which is, who is coffee good for and under what circumstances? And who is coffee bad for and under what circumstances? And that's the same and that's as me. That's exactly what Wyom is about. That's what we do every day. We don't treat that's human not. beings the same because they're completely different. And we, we know this now. Well, what's a good thing, Dr. Momo, if you don't mind, Byron, uh, um, I was going to say, what's, what's very exciting about the sort of new model approach to health is that you can respect people's profound individuality while sort of systemizing health. It sort of, uh, it solves the problem. Wow. You, know what I mean? you get to eat your cake and have it too. Yeah. Don't because it'll cause inflammation down, yeah. down <laughs> well in your said. dirty well clothes. Said. But I think the bottom line well, here is though, is the bottom line is that ultimately what your plan is, is to have a world where pharmaceuticals don't cure these chronic diseases food mm. is medicine and it will it, as long as it's catered to that person it can cure these chronic diseases well, not cure, is what we're prevent saying. is what we're prevent, saying well, prevention yeah. instead of cure right yeah 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 so let me let me exactly so let me let me exactly tell you the biome vision so when i you know when i plotted this eight years ago on a, on a piece of paper every single scientist in the room laughed and when I submitted first proposals for this, scientific proposals to the scientific community, they threw it in trash. They said, really? what is this? We're talking about, you're going to analyze poop and tell people what to eat? But now I can I'm go to- you about Uber. 10 years later. <laughs> I can, that was that. Eight years later, I can go to an Uber and, and the person is going to be telling me how much they believe in nutrition and microbiome and all that stuff. So the world's changed dramatically in the last eight years. But let's talk That's about great. the biome vision. High five but, to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Mo Dr. To Momo, you. I'm just going to, sorry to interject right here because we actually are getting towards the end of our podcast. And I just want to know if there are any key points we want to get. And can I say that this, 
is there any chance we'd ever get you on again? Because I don't feel like we've even Anytime. dug Anytime. deep yeah. enough. I feel, yeah, I feel we could dig I a lot deeper. Live for this. I mean, particularly I because, this. because with Tom Hopper and his child and what he's going with autism, yeah. that's going to be a big focus that we'd like to go in deep on at some point. I think you definitely have a lot of opinions, which would be. Well, I, I definitely do. And I think what we should do is if we're going to focus on autism, we should bring some major players like, like Love that. Rosie. We should have them on the podcast and I can get them on. <laughs> Yes, and, uh, that would be amazing. I, you are now officially working for the podcast. <laughs> You're a lot. I got nothing else better to do. Yeah, they, are, they, are, they are super busy, but they're wonderful people. And they, they are scientists that I have a huge respect for. They're basically blazing new trails in this complex wow. field. So, um, okay. yeah, you can have me back anytime, literally. Just I'm nice on 24 7. Thank you, Momo. So, yeah. So Any closing thoughts, end? Dr. Momo? <laughs> like, any, like Jerry Springer at the end of uh, at the end of one of his uh, lectures. I, I think I think basically the closing thoughts are that everyone deserves their own diet. We need to seek data driven personalized diets that will prevent chronic diseases, so that we can live long and healthy lives. Mm. Oh. Do you know what you have? Like Naveen in, inspired me when we uh, interviewed him. You've inspired me to to take the Viome results a bit more seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, well, that's what's really interesting. I spoke to my... Uh, I'm going to write all of the fucking... All the I stuff spoke to my dad earlier about taking the test and he wants to take it now, but he was saying, oh, but what if there's something on there that I like that I don't want to eat? <laughs> You're like, well, and, you, you can't eat it anymore. Well, I was like, well, that's I mean, your you choice, know, dad. You know, yeah. you, you make that decision yourself, whether you want to make the decision that that thing could be harming you just as a micro boogeyman in there going. Eh. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. I mean, just because you're healthy today, let's say you're in your 40s, your heart disease, your Alzheimer's, your Parkinson's may be setting on and you don't know that. And so mm. just because you're healthy today, you know, people who have a heart attack, they were perfectly healthy the day before. They may have been thin, they may have been athletic and they still have a heart attack. So you just have to make that decision. Do you want to live a long, healthy life or do you want to risk it and die young or suffer from some kind of a chronic disease. Yeah. I always say this, that everyone, everyone's happy until they are in a situation where they're in peril or if they're going to die, you know, and then they think, oh, if only, if only. And this is the answer to that, in first, my opinion. Yeah. First you get them in the heart and then you get them in the gut. Nice work, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> nice That's work. Right. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely amazing. Dr. Momo, thank you so much. and so generous for your time. Yeah, man. Thanks so much, man. It's been a such a pleasure. Stay soapy. <laughs> hey, wait, wait. Oh, there you are. His tuning fork. There you go. God bless. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mo. We'll speak to you again very soon. Thank you for your time. What an honor. The Earth Locker is produced by Byron Knight. Edited and designed by the multi-talented Storm Stewart. Director of photography is Christopher Assock. This podcast represents the opinions of the hosts and guests to the show, not the parent or affiliate companies of The Earth Locker. All content of this podcast is solely owned and copyrights reserved by The Earth Locker. The contents here should not be taken as medical, financial, psychological, spiritual, or public transport advice. The show is for informational purposes only, and because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions, talk to your financial advisor, especially if you wish to invest in this podcast. Speak with your elders about personal and spiritual matters because they know shit, because they've lived it. The content of this podcast might have settled during transport and batteries are not included. Thank you for listening to The Earth Locker.